We are recording. Excellent. Welcome to another edition of Book Talk with Jordan and Stefan. Our book this month is Birth of Fire by Jerry Purnell. I had had the idea to read this book. I'd wanted to do a Purnell uh, book for a while, and unfortunately he passed away uh, last October, uh, which is certainly a loss to the science fiction community. Uh, and as uh, one interesting thing I noticed was that um, one of the last things he did before he passed was attend Dragon Con here in Atlanta, so I thought that was really cool. Anyway, uh, Jerry Purnell, if you don't know, is a long-standing luminary in the field of science fiction uh, with a specific interest in military science fiction and, um, sh uh, I suppose I should say, uh, very politically-minded science fiction, military science fiction especially, but he uh, is he was unabashedly conservative and very, very... Um, intricate in his uh, political science arguments. So I had originally thought about doing one of his collaboration novels. He's primarily known as a collaborative author uh, and most most frequently associated with Larry Niven, uh, with whom he's written The Moat in God's Eye, The Gripping Hand, Lucifer's Hammer, and uh, some others like that. Uh, and those are very, very hugely famous. I think, Mo I think the Moat in God's Eye got the Hugo. I'm not sure, um, but I have to check that. But I know that uh, there, uh, those are just hugely well received books. And I think that you know, Stefan and I were talking. There, there's kind of, I mean, there's going to be a lot to discuss here. But doing a single solo Jerry Purnell novel, I, I decided I wanted to do that because. Uh, of his passing. I figured it'd be better to focus just on him. Uh, <clears throat> I have a, I have here the uh, science fiction, encycl illustrated science fiction encyclopedia by uh, John Clute, and it is um, a, a wonderful resource if you've not, uh, if you've not read it uh, or are not familiar with it. It's an excellent resource and uh, was useful to me as a kid kind of finding, you know, this is pre-internet, uh, if you can believe that, trying to find out all of the major luminaries of, uh, the, of science fiction, and this was a great resource for that. So, <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the Science Fiction Encyclopedia, Illustrated Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, it uh, has an entry for Larry Niven. It does not have a single entry for Jerry Purnell. Hmm. It has only an entry for Larry Niven, with a sidebar mentioning Jerry Purnell, which is strange because the first sentence of the damn sidebar is, Purnell is no mere sidebar to Niven. <laughs> <clears throat> it goes on to say, novels like The Mode in God's Eye and Oath of Fealty, their most notorious assault on liberal values, are clearly shared enterprises. But Purnell's solo career is not as remarkable. King David's spaceship is a fine adventure, but most of his co-Dominion series was written with Niven and others. Alone, he is hard to focus on. And um, when, you know, sometimes <clears throat> sometimes I agree with John Clute uh, on an editorial level, and sometimes I don't. Uh, but in that context... Um, the uh, you know and and to, to give you an example of why in in this same book he actually at one point says uh, just in a timeline of science fiction major science fiction releases he's in like seven, 1975 he says Harlan Ellison's a boy and his dog is released dog lovers hate it and I was like okay that's that's weird it's like one of the most benevolent dog owner friendly books ever but. The, uh, I, I asked Harlan Ellison about that, and he said, to his knowledge, the only people who hated a boy and his dog were the grandmothers that took their kids to see the sweet movie about the boy and his dog and ended uh. up seeing this post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, cannibalistic um, insanity and everything. But, <clears throat> so, that brings us around to... Birth of Fire, and it, it, it includes writing it. Like I said, I may not always agree with Clute's editorial observations, but 
uh, his observation about Cornell being hard to focus on solo is absolutely true. Because here's the thing, as I, I've been thinking about how best to put perspective on this, and this is the way it's come to me. If you listen to the major, you know, the, the major songwriting duos like Simon and Garfunkel or uh, Elton John and Bernie Taupin or personal favorite of mine, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan, RIP Walter Becker. But in all of these cases, there are, if you look at like Walter Becker and Donald Fagan or John Lennon, Paul McCartney, that kind of thing, if you listen to their work together, and you get very familiar with that, then you listen to their solo albums, you really start to feel and understand what they each one of these people brought to the table. <clears throat> so, for example, like, you know, John Lennon brought all of the uh, rage and passion, the angry young man aspect of the Beatles, and Paul McCartney brought the whimsy and the fancifulness and the uh you know the uh trippiness and all that you know and that's that's very much what you realize if you read jerry purnell's solo what he brings to a larger work and what what he brings to the uh, to a larger work are some very high peaks but what he what he loses in his solo works are some very low valleys um I want to. I want to also emphasize while I'm thinking about it because we're not going to spend much time talking about this. But um, one one thing I also one major credit I want to give Jerry Purnell. If you do not, if you are a reader of any kind of um, software, computer journalism, or criticism or anything like that, Jerry Purnell was a pioneer in that field with his commentaries for Byte Magazine. Um, and the, the archives of his Byte Magazine articles are, uh, they're, they're out there, you can find them, they're phenomenal, and those, those really are good. There's also a hilarious, uh, parody of his Byte Magazine articles by Jerry Corwell that's, uh, quite good. But anyway, so, we come now to Birth of Fire, and I've been doing so much talking, and I'm gonna let Stefan take over in just a second, but basically put, uh, you know, we mentioned him being conservative. Well, oh man, this this book, this is the Adventures of Cliven Bundy in space. Uh, Stefan, <laughs> it, it definitely feels like something that was written in the sixties and seventies, uh, mm -hmm. the time of Heinlein, the time of. Roddenberry, there's there's definitely this frontiersman spirit to it, and that's that's cool. Like these are things that we think of when we think of colonizing Mars. the The problem is the setup for all the pieces, regardless of where it takes place. Like this could have been a story that took place anywhere because mm -hmm. the lack of detail or the lack of connecting detail of what was going on. Like I I remember reading the story a, m a month or two ago, and I was like, I'm coming back to it, I was like what. What happened? I don't recall exactly. Like stuff just happens. Yeah. So, so yeah. page one or, or page sixty or whatever, stuff will happen. Then the next paragraph they'll jump to another scene, and it's mm -hmm. in the same chapter. And you're like, why? Why did this happen? So yeah. yeah, it's very hard to follow. Now the the main idea is that there's a guy from Earth named Garrett, who's uh, he got into some trouble with a gang. His mm -hmm. lawyer says, okay, you're going to spend twenty years in jail for for a murder you didn't do, or you can go to Mars where they need help and you can work in an in indentured servitude, essentially. He's basically a slave. Mm -hmm. And uh, help out, you know, build the colonies up there. So he does that, which is kind of crazy because if you could have indentured servitude, you could have it on Earth yeah. for, for dozens of reasons better than going all the way to Mars and whatever else is, is going to happen there. So, mm -hmm. so the first half of the book is just him getting used to Mars and settling in and... and, and farming yeah. and they farm like you know, corn and stuff and they mm -hmm. and they have things called tractors yeah and the tractors work under biodomes mm -hmm. but apparently they also work outside i didn't understand that because there's there's lots of scenes outside on the on the 
yeah. the surface of Mars and there's tractors. But why would you want tractors on the surface of Mars? Like there's all these little things that don't yeah. really add up when you start looking and, at the details. Yeah, and that's the thing is it's like, uh, you know, if you, if you really th stop and think about that question, uh, why would you want tractors on the surface of Mars, the answer that you uh, kind of unfortunately come to is, well, because we need something, we're going to need something to move our militia around later in the book, you know. Yeah, it's, it's really disconnected. So a lot of the scenes, a lot of the romance, a lot of the drama, all the ideas... For setting up the idea, for the, the, the plot is there. Like the, the plot makes sense. It could go here to go there. We get we ended up get revealing some of it when it doesn't make sense. So it's not a, a bad mm -hmm. plot. But all the things that that you hang from the plot are just sort of there for the sake of being there. Mm -hmm. And it's like okay, well, at the, near the climax of the story, it's like okay, we got to go get some uranium. And you're like, why? So we can make a bomb. Why? So we can tell Earth and all the the the, the corporate. Because I think Earth is now corporatist to, to hell. Everyone's uh, controlled by corporations. So you know Mars is this this, this bastion of freedom or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we, they got to send a signal, so they need a weapon. And they talk about how they're going to attack an Earth colony. It's like <clears throat> I, I don't know. Like there's no mention of this. So what do they do? They built they they somehow they somehow build a bomb. And, yeah. And the yeah. person who ends up building it ends up being the love interest, and she's not even a, a scientist. She just she's just. She's just there, and she can yeah. somehow build a, a nuclear bomb. So it just, it's just a continuation of these scenes where it's like, oh, you can do this now. And, oh, well, we're going over here now, and now this is going to happen. And it just keeps going on and on like that. Yeah. So there's yeah. something and there, missing. And every single character in the book, every single character in the book sounds like they talk like this. It feels it feels like a frontier. It feels like yeah. they're, they're somewhere in, in some not quite space world, but it is space because they talk about tanks. But there's there's air tanks, there's there's hydroponic tanks, there's there's actual tanks. Yeah, <laughs> like 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 mechanized infantry tanks, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, and, and it's so strange because they're fighting this war with the federations or the feds, or because they own essentially own the, the Mars uh, uh, colonies, so. <laughs> It's like, oh, great. Okay, so we have to make a militia now to fight these guys, and our character gets involved in that, and yeah, it, it's sort of this this strange uh, because he's the hero, because he's the protagonist, he gets involved, mm -hmm. and he can he can always push through things, and then yeah, there's there's a few number of women, and the few number of women who are there end up appreciating him or liking him more. It's it's very odd how these scenes come well, together. Yeah, it's one of those. I mean, there, there's a certain James Bond escapist element to it, with all, especially with the women, where it's like every single one of them is just immediately gaga for him, you know. And it's like, no, 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 no. There's no uh, the and and the thing, the main character that he falls in love with, uh, Erica, it, she's, um, it, it's literally like. It, People are going to think we're exaggerating here, but it's literally like they meet, and within one conversation, they are completely and totally enamored with each other, and there's literally no explanation as to why that just occurred. I mean, it's it's literally like it, it, it it's almost it's it's almost like okay, imagine if you are you you have a realtor showing you a house. And she takes you and says, okay, this is the living room, upstairs, da-da-da-da-da-da, all this. And then you lean in to kiss her, and she says, no, I've never felt this way before. We can't rush things. It's like, <laughs> it's literally that. It's like, oh, my God. It, but it's not just with the drama. It's also with scenes. Like, there's a scene, yeah. it was this big scene where uh, Garrett has to take over a power station. And yeah. then in the next page over, it's... Oh, by the way, all your Confederates—they, uh, you know—they—they—they they, they took not only that, they took a base and they took a colony, and they have yeah. all these tanks now. And you're like, whoa, what, what did, where did this all come from? So it's kind of yeah. every every other scene is like that. It just it just ha yeah. things just happen, and you don't yeah. know why, and it drives right. me nuts because I'm thinking there's got to be a lot of things like this is a this is a really cool idea where you're on you're you're on the frontier of Mars. You have this technology. It's not really explained. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Fine. You, you've got like ballistic 
uh, Elon Musk rockets, you know, that can go yeah, yeah. across the planet. Yeah, okay, fine, whatever. Yeah, you got this stuff. You're not explaining it. I can, I, can, I can go with you. But then not only is that not explained, so is the scene itself and then the next scene and the next character. And then for some mm-hmm. reason, the next character betrays you and you're like, why? And then somehow the next character figures out they were trying to poison your coffee, but there's no information as to how they figured that out. Yeah. So they use uh, another form of poison. It's like, oh, they thought of everything. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, it it really is a mess and uh the I mean, it's you know, it, it it's obviously the weird thing is it's obviously a pulp novel. In yes. fact, and my my copy is printed on uh, reconstituted paper, so it really is a pulp novel, but they um the the thing is there's just not it's it's not it doesn't have I mean, it, it really is, uh, to, to use a very appropriate expression, it's very all hat and no cattle. I mean, it's we've got a framework here yeah. of an idea uh, and a setup for a good idea. And, the, and this idea of like, okay, now, granted, I do think that it's one of the hallmarks of bad science fiction writing to take a plot that would only, that could easily just work on Earth and put it in space and call that science fiction. And that's what this is. I mean, this is, like I said, it's Clive and Bundy in space. I mean, it's just a, a big dramatic standoff uh, that happens to be uh, between planets rather than, um, you know, um, counties or something. Right. It feels, and It feels yeah. like a, a first draft that yeah. if yeah. an editor took it and said, okay, yeah, I cleaned it up for you. Here you go. And then he just published it. He didn't actually have someone else clean things up you didn't actually have mm-hmm. someone connect things or uh, apparently a second writer would have helped because they'd say oh okay i see what you want to do here let yeah. me fill in the blanks let me get rid of that let me like that's what this yeah. needed it really needed yeah. a one over by someone else to say i like your ideas i don't know if you were tired or drugged or not paying attention or whatever you were <laughs> just let's just go through it together and we'll make it better. Yeah. and that never happened so right right and that's i mean it's it's breathtakingly obvious why jerry pernell's best work is done collaboratively <laughs> uh so you know this is a guy who he loves the science and the engineering aspect of it and uh and and he uh, his background is actually in engineering and um he actually worked on the uh, Star Wars missile defense system under Reagan, so that gives oh, wow. you an idea. I mean, yeah, that that aspect of his knowledge is uh, expansive, to say the least. So this is a guy who he loves the science, the hard science aspect of it. And I think, you know, if I was going to see if this was appealing to anybody, you know, we, we all, I think, were fascinated by The Martian by Andy Weir. And uh, it, that is... You know, what makes that so fascinating is just the uh, the elements of human ingenuity and figuring out how to survive on this world. There are bits of that in this book, and I think anyone who liked that would enjoy that, but you would probably be better served just reading The Martian again yeah. uh, as opposed to this. I mean, it's to, now, and, and the thing is that the writing style, I mean, it's almost... I, I hate to say this, it's almost like he has no writing style, because listen to listen to this. This is just a couple of paragraphs from the beginning of Chapter 2. Now, uh, okay, actually, you know what? No, I'm going to read you the last couple of paragraphs of Chapter 1. So this is where he's being given the offer to go to Mars. It says, um, um, uh, the person he's talking to says, Yes, you can stay out of prison if you stay here, but you've got another, or you can't stay out of prison if you stay here, but you've got another option. Voluntary exile, transportation for life. I can arrange it for you. I didn't have to think about it. Not really. I already knew my answer. I had read about the colony program and how they needed more men. There had been a time or two back at Francis Scott Key when I'd toyed with the idea of shipping out as a volunteer. I, it sure as hell beat what, what I had coming here. Why not go to Mars? Where do I sign up? Okay. So this is now, this is the writing of, the, or the narration of a man who has just arrived on another planet for the first time in his life. Listen to how it goes. Mars is a bleak place, but it was exciting to be there just the same. They trooped us into a clear plastic dome where we got our first look at the outside. It was a big dome, a couple hundred feet across, and not at all safe, but they didn't tell us that. 
the thing that struck me most was the stars. It was the it was daylight outside, and all the sun. Although the sun looked a little small, it seemed about as bright as I remembered it being on Earth. The next thing I noticed was the sharp outline of the shadows. Mars boasted the darkest shadows I'd ever seen. Although everything the sun hit was brightly lit, that was strange enough. But the stars got to me. I mean, and that's like, I I guess you could say. This is a this character Garrett. He's a simple man, or yeah. he's, he's not a man of words, or that kind of thing. But I mean, you need to. It, it, it just yeah, it just feels like it, it feels like science fiction for good old boys. I mean, it really does, and it, it's yeah. There's there's all kinds of descriptions that I'm I'm kind of curious whether he didn't know or didn't care to look at the the science of the atmosphere of Mars or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's there's Sarge wants to he's thinking of pumping in like oxygen into the atmosphere which will make it like one tenth of Earth and that'll be so you can get out of your suits and I'm like no <laughs> that's not going to work you're not going to just pump oxygen into the atmosphere and yeah. then, and then that's it the same with the wind as like near the end of the book it's like oh there was a wind whipping past but it was very thin not any real problem well yeah obviously the wind's not going to be any real problem if you're one one hundredth of the atmosphere of Earth and it's going at like you know, 60 miles an hour. Another thing, he, he changes between his miles and kilometers. He, he changes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, why are you doing that? Like, what what are you, is it American? Are you trying to be imperial? Like, what is what is the measurement here? Like, he talks about how uh, uh, a mountain bigger than Mount Everest. I'm thinking, oh, okay, thank you. I could wrap my head around that. Yeah. And, and it's like 2,000 2, miles across. I'm thinking, great, okay, so that's like from Toronto to Vancouver, or, or but he doesn't he doesn't describe how big. It's actually three times the size mm -hmm. of Mount Everest, two thousand miles, yeah. pretty pretty big. So giving me a visual helps, but it's not accurate, right? He's he's yeah. missing details. Uh, same with like we talked about before we started broadcasting was like the pressure tents. What the hell's a pressure tent? You, yeah, you cannot. Well, you can try, but you certainly will not be able to make a very good tent that can pressurize air outside of the atmosphere of Mars. It just wouldn't work. Like the thing would, mm -hmm. would implode. So you have to ha you have to explain, okay, this thing is made out of some super durable, super flexible material. And then he, he described an airlock. Oh, no, he didn't describe an airlock. He said there was an airlock. Great. Mm -hmm. What does it do? Does the airlock close? Is there two doors? Is there, yeah. is there a, a pump system? Like how does that depressure? How does it increase? Like I want to know. Yeah. It's like, no, it's just an airlock. We got tents, and then it was a militia, and they put in the barracks, and you're like, oh, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I know. It's it's like I, the, the quote on the back. Uh, there's a quote on the back of this one from Paul Anderson. It says, excellent science fiction adventure, a depth of meaning that goes beyond the story. And I'm like, wow. not really. No. <laughs> We're not talking about 2001, A Space Odyssey here. And the thing is, I mean, I, talking about the writing style, like I have Ringworld by Larry Niven here. Listen to how that begins, by contrast. In the nighttime heart of Beirut, in one of a row of general address transfer booths, Louis Wu flickered into reality. His foot-length queue was as white and shiny as artificial snow. His skin and depleted scalp were chrome yellow. The irises of his eyes were gold. His robe was royal blue, with a golden stereopic dragon superimposed. In the, distant, in the instant he appeared, he was smiling widely, showing pearly, perfect, perfectly standard teeth, smiling and waving. But the smile was already fading, and in a moment it was gone, and the sag of his face was like a rubber mask melting. Louis Wu showed his age. That's writing. <laughs> That's <laughs> literature. That's how description works. That's... Uh, and so you see, okay, obviously we get Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell together and we've got something. But, oh, man, yeah. Well, I, the sake of having to have more than one writer on a project just to make the other writer better is probably not a good collaboration. Yeah. Unless, unless there's something about that guy who doesn't know how to write but he has really great ideas. Mm -hmm. And the idea of going to Mars and having a... Uh, I guess this kind of scenario where who owns what, or is there going to be a revolution? Are people going to make ownership of Mars? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a break from Earth? That's I haven't really seen that uh, this early in science fiction. I'm sure it's it's probably even earlier. I just haven't read any books about that. So mm -hmm. historically, it's it's a fine idea. It's just trying to explain that in a way that is, in, is first of all is it first is it interesting to read, 
And is it worthwhile to read? That's where I'm having the problem of, of actually going yeah. through this and saying, okay, I think I know what you're getting at here. I can't see it happening that way. And mm -hmm. the same with this character. Okay, I think I get where this person's coming from. Why did it happen that way? Like the betrayal, I'm still sort of like, yeah. why, why did the betrayal happen the way it did out of yeah. literally nowhere? Because again, events just happen. There's, yeah. no, there's no buildup. It's like the next, the next paragraph, oh, and now he's unconscious. Yeah. Uh, and then, <laughs> it's just so awkward. It's like, did you, was this like a, it felt like more like a screenplay where there's, there's a big bold or a big block of description of events happening in the background and then there's dialogue. And then there's mm -hmm. like, Bob said this and then Mary says this and da, 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 da. And then everything else happens in a scene. That's how I interpreted a lot of this because these paragraphs were just one big, sometimes one big block of dialogue, sometimes one big block of, block of description. And mm -hmm. it was so mundane. It was like, okay, well, I turned this on and I got in the, into the suit. and da, da, da. I'm Like, great, okay. And then now he's like, he's already traveled like five miles to where he had to go. And now he's already in yeah. the, and it's within a span of four paragraphs. So mm -hmm. it's it's a little jarring of, pa like pacing, I don't know if that's relevant. I don't know if you could say this, because it's, it's virtually a novel. I, I wouldn't call it yeah. a full novel, but it's the size of a novel in between mm -hmm. that of a novella. And the pacing is is just like boom, I'm there, and boom, you're there, and you're like, no, <laughs> yeah, that's not pacing, that's teleportation. You're just you're just going from A to F, and then you're going somewhere down the line to yeah. M or N. Like, it doesn't work that way. Well, it's it's like it it kept, to me it kept feeling like watching a B movie where you know there are certain yeah. B movies, you know, they're good B movies. Don't get me wrong, but <clears throat> there are you know so many B movies. It's just like. You, you you kind of like get a feeling like you don't really know why you're watching this movie. I mean, it's like a good movie should get you into the story, should take you out of yourself and make you care about the characters. And whereas with a B movie, like you're very conscious that you're seeing a movie, it's very formulaic, it's very stiff, it doesn't draw you in. That's what this was. I, I felt this could be an actually a pretty decent miniseries on TV on the Space Channel. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of the visuals would convey, I'd say, mm -hmm. half, if not more than half, of the ideas he wants to yeah. do. And then you'll you'll get like a, a dialogue writer or a director saying, okay, with this scene where she poisons you, this is what has to happen or else we won't understand that. And he'd be like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And the actors would actually do that and then you wouldn't have to have dialogue yeah. or descriptions. It would just be visual. That could work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah that it, it it could work so it's it, it it part of it yeah it's just not the right medium certain certain stories just don't need to be told certain ways um what did you think of the politics in this because to me i mean i can you know uh i can read stuff all across the board and appreciate uh you know i i uh, you know it's kind of I, I, with politics and we i, I bring this up cuz science fiction so often is thought of being thought of as being left of center um, or at least center left uh, in, so, uh, in so many ways, but I, I'm interested in uh, you know science fiction that'll take a strong political, a strong and well argued political stance in any direction. Um, that said, in this, you know, I mean, my God, I consider myself a libertarian, but what the the world that they want to set up this uh, this ungoverned Martian world that they want to live in it's like it was summarized most effectively for me in one of the dialogues where one of the characters uh who remember everyone in this book sounds like they talk like this uh one of the uh, characters says heck we don't is something like we don't need government inspectors if you cook a bad batch of beer and it makes people sick they'll uh make you drink a gallon of it and laugh at you and i'm like yeah i think if i you know what i think if i make beer that makes you sick i'd rather uh pay your medical expenses and uh let that be that you know it's like uh <laughs> you don't uh you you we i you, you don't want to live i understand wanting to live in a world with minimalist government i don't want to live in a world that is run by vigilantes you know <laughs> well there's and, a there's a scene at the end where they they say well what happens if you remove who's in power and you put your friends in power and they don't do a good job. It's like, well, we'll get rid of them. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> keep rebel, yeah. Keep constant another, rebellion, yeah. Uh, yeah, 
Which, I mean, weirdly, though, there is, if you think about Camus' arguments about revolution and rebellion, he's, he, he argued that that's, that's all there ever will be, that, that there will never be a utopian society, there will only ever be lulls between the rebellions. Um, and, um, the, uh, and so that, that could be the case. I didn't, I mean, his, the thing is, I didn't find the premise particularly offensive. This is a, this is presenting a sense of, uh, you know, the, uh, sort of economic conservatism is business conservatism is what they want. They want the government to right. stop taxing them into poverty. They want the government to stop, um, regulating the, uh, the hell out of them. These are all things that you can make a reasonable and uh, a reasonable case for without abandoning, uh, say, more socially liberal values, and that's why I consider myself libertarian. But um, it, it doesn't. It, it feels like the what they want, um, it, you know, what what they're implying or what he's implying is that once you live in this world, this this. Uh, frontier world of random vigilantism where everybody, you know, the whole basis of their morality is we're Mars men and our word is good. And it's like, you know, which anytime you hear someone say something like that, you just want to punch him. You know, it's like <laughs> if, if your word is good, you don't have to tell me. Well, the, I, I think they still, want, I, as far as I understood the, the protagonist, he actually still wanted or they, he still expected the, the corporations to set up shop on Mars or else yeah. the farmers wouldn't eat, like they wouldn't have an economy. So they yeah. still want they still wanted that aspect, which is, you know, right. that's fine. That's nothing to do with government. But Yeah, they still want trade relations. That's oh, understandable. Yeah. Exactly. But they want to get rid of all the other stuff that where the federal, the feds come in and, and with tanks and whatever and, and, yeah. and destroy things and take things over. So mm -hmm. that was fine. I was like, all right, that's that makes some sense. I understand mm -hmm. where they're going with that. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't so much a focus on that because he was pretty much his own military with uh, mm -hmm. the guys there who ended up rebelling anyway. And once the bomb goes off, it's like, oh, then everyone's going to start rebelling. So mm -hmm. I, I guess that was the idea was that mm -hmm. there has to be an event which yeah. causes people to say, ah, we have individual authority to do what we like. Mm -hmm. We're going to band together and go against whatever and, and still have relations with earth on on a on an independent way fine okay great that that was yeah. good enough but getting to that point was a little yeah confusing because there were the militia there was the the makeup of the penal colony then there was the feds who came in then there were the other colonies that like the universities and and all the other mm -hmm. corporations that were involved so mm -hmm. there were a lot of organizations they didn't really quite explain Mm -hmm. where or what they were doing because they all had their own motivations which is fine mm -hmm. yeah. but it, it wasn't as clear as okay now the university is with us okay now we took over that colony now they're with us it was just like oh now mm -hmm. we took over this colony yeah now yeah. what yeah well it's there were so many there were a lot of questions I had like about that like you've had at this point people who are native to Mars they were born on Mars and so that means they've lived inside these tightly knit containment facilities their entire life and i'm thinking shouldn't like nearsightedness be a problem i mean shouldn't these be almost like mole people after a few generations you know that kind of thing yeah the, the yeah. sunlight the radiation uh yeah the the suits like there's only like two kinds of suits and there's the generic mm -hmm. kind that fits everyone which isn't very good and then there's the working kind the pea suits mm -hmm. so yeah, there's there's a lack of detail that you would expect mm -hmm. from a science fiction story on those things yeah. alone. But yeah. there are there are details I do like. They, they they talk about what they farm and how they farm and the beer they mm -hmm. make and the kinds of beer. Yeah. That's kind of cool, but that's what you want out of these kinds of stories. And because he created this world and just just sort of bare bones it the entire time, it it, it gives you the sense of, "Oh, we're really frontiering it out here." There's not much out here, but at the same time, wait a second, you're a spaceman. You're in mm. a colony biodome, tractor dome, spacesuit, P tent, all these things. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of assumed that mm -hmm. we know what's going on and what these things are. And this is yeah. why this is why I think it would have been great as a comic that's pulp or a, mm -hmm. a, a miniseries on like the, the Discovery Channel mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 
And it, yeah, it's, uh, and I, I, I just keep coming back to, uh, well, I, I keep coming back to the, there are a lot of things, but um, one, one of the things, talking about that system of values and everything, you see in the book, Certain air, certain points, uh, and I, I try not to give anything away, but like the big betrayal that happens at the end, by which which is done by a character that exists for no other reason but to betray the main character. Um, you know that uh, uh, as, as as I think about that, you know, when they're dealing with that character, one of them's like, "Well, shoot the bitch now," and one of them's like, "Oh, let's let's think of what we want to do with her and everything." And it just immediately becomes government by mob rule, you know. And that's that's the thing is it's like, uh, you, you know, they they don't want they don't want the government ganging up on the colony in a large group or in large numbers. But they want to be yet they want to be left alone so that they, they can gang up on each other internally in small numbers. And it's just an impossibly, it's an impossible to sustain model. And I mean, it's just throughout, I'm not going to, I don't want to spend the entire, an entire podcast or spend hours and hours talking about what should, you know, what, what I think about the holes in this political theory. But one of the things I read about Jerry Purnell uh, and his writing is someone said that he likes to, he likes to present a series of, uh, events that lead to a politically incorrect solution and challenge the reader to tell him where he was wrong in coming to that conclusion. Yeah. Well, I, as, as I'm looking at this, I mean, this, I, I, not only can I, I mean, not only can I point out all the areas where he's wrong and wanting to live on Mars this way, I, I, I'm, it's almost, it's almost difficult to even, suggest that he might be right about how to live on Mars. I mean, this is this is ridiculous and uh or it's just ridiculously um it's it's I mean it's it's insane off-grid living on Mars and I just <laughs> yeah. can't it's pretty I crazy. Can't, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's like at one point towards the beginning of the book, you know, Garrett Pitson has been Working in the you know working in the biodomes and what is what was it his suit depressurizes and so he immediately has to scream so that he doesn't um, to get all the air out of his lungs so he doesn't combust from inside or something and I'm thinking who who and then and then he talks about how this is the happiest he's been in his life I'm like who in the holy fuck wants to live like that <laughs> at any minute your suit depressurizes you have to scream all the air out of your lungs. Then you have ten seconds before you lose consciousness to hit this button and that button. I'm like, yeah, no, I think not. Uh, you know, it's so. I I I just uh, you know I'm sure we'll probably get a lot of comments, or if if, if we get any respondents uh, at all, we'll probably get some commenters that are like, yeah, if you knew what it was like to work in the fields and on his day in your life, and you'd be blah 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 blah. It's like, well, you know what, this bud's for you. Enjoy it. Uh, I'm I'm going to go read something else. <laughs> yeah, talking about other books to read, uh, I would say anything by Heinlein because or yes. Heinlein, just because uh, I think he's done it better, and okay. it comes it comes roughly at the same period, and I think that's where a lot of the the ideas and the original creativity came from. So if you read, um, well, Starship Troopers is always the, the number one. But mm -hmm. uh, the the moon is a strange mistress. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one is it has, it has to do with the moon, but it's basically the same argument or the same scenario where you have a rebellion and they mm -hmm. have these these nuclear warheads and all that good stuff. So that would probably be actually I think it won an, an award. So that would probably be a better suggestion, and mm -hmm. it's it's a lot easier to read. I could tell you that it's it's yeah. just lovely stuff. Well. The, absolutely, and Heinlein is probably he, Heinlein. I think is a much more fast is much more fascinating from a political standpoint because, hmm. on the one hand, if you read Starship Troopers, people have argued that that book is a tacit endorsement of fascism. Oh, really? Uh, but yeah, but if you uh, 
if you turn it around, uh, or if you turn around then and read um, Friday, which is probably my favorite by him, or A Stranger in a Strange Land and all that, these are the books that, you know, he was hugely pro-free love, sexual revolution, LGBT rights, all of that. I mean, so you get this wide spectrum of ideas and thought from Heinlein, and it's much more fascinating and much more um, captivating to, to explore that. So that's... I mean, yeah, that, that uh, Stefan, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I, I keep trying to, I, I will say this, if you want good, just good pulp military science fiction, read the, there is a four novel adaptation of the video game Doom. That's D-O-O-M, Doom. Not Dune like Frank Herbert, but Doom, the video game, the computer game we all grew up with. There is a four-novel adaptation written by Daphid Abhu and Brent Lena Wyver, and that is actually really well uh, well done. In fact, I've got... Uh, hang on just one second. As I'm sitting here, I look over on my bookshelf, which uh, if, if anyone who's seen my videos knows my bookshelf is, uh, you know... Um, slightly slightly larger than um, uh, Wembley Stadium but uh, okay so like this is just the description for the the jacket copy for Doom Infernal Sky which is the third book in the series Hawaii the last outpost of colonization on on an earth overrun by demons traders and nightmarish creatures straight out of the pits of hell humanity seems doomed to a bloody ending then Hawaii receives a message from aliens claiming to be on our side in the battle our last chance make contact the only man for the job corporal Flynn Taggart US Marine Corps fly to his friends he led the fight against the demon invaders when they swarmed through the gates at Phobos base now Fly's got to face the toughest task of his dirty career. Return to Phobos and fight his way past those demons to contact mankind's would-be rescuers. Okay. That's interesting. You know? And this that's and those books, if you want good if you want good, fun, pulp military science fiction, uh, don't uh, you know, don't waste your time on Vox Day or whatever. Just read the Doom series uh, by Daffy Dab Hugh and Brand Lena Wyver. And um, Bradley and Wiper, I'm sorry. Uh, absolutely, just great, entertaining. Not no degree of inter intellectual depth, but always fun, always engaging. So I highly recommend that instead. Uh, so I think I think that about wraps it up. Uh, anything else you want to add, Stefan? No, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, next month or next time, uh, rather, we will be doing. Um, Thunderhead by Neil Schusterman, which, yes, <laughs> two thumbs up, Stefan's giving me two thumbs up, yeah, which because, oh my god, like, first of all, Scythe was one of our favorite, one of the, I, one of our mutually favorite books in the Book Talk series that we've done, we love that, and then Thunderhead is the sequel to that, and, um, it's uh, I've been reading that one concurrently. I'm almost done with it, and I'm reading been reading that concurrently with uh, Birth of Fire, and the difference is just <laughs> oh god, night and day. It's oh man, yeah. Um, but anyway, so that will be next time, and uh, then following that, we will be doing uh, My Friend Dahmer by Durf Factor. All right, peace out.